Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Digital Transformation and the Process Platform Imperative. So here is our agenda for today. First, we will be hearing from Neil Ward Dutton, Research Director at MWD Advisors. Neil will share findings from a year of research into how organizations are seeking to drive new business results from digital technologies and techniques and the role of business process platforms in innovation and other business change initiatives. We will then be joined by PNMs of clients Southwest Water. Specifically, Alistair, Michelle, and John will be sharing details of their BPM project with PNM Soft's process platform to transform digitally their business and address the open water regulations coming into effect in 2017. Lastly, PNM Soft's CTO James Luxford will be showcasing our process platform over a very brief demonstration. We will be closing with Q&A session. And speaking of which, you can type your questions on the GoToWebinar widget for the panel of speakers, and we will address them at the end of the session. So without further ado, I shall pass to Neil Ward Dutton for his fascinating research findings on digital transformation and process platforms. Neil? Hi there, Vasilios, and uh, thank you very much for having me along. And hello, everyone. Um, all right, let me just make sure I can share my screen here. Uh, there we go. Okay, hopefully you can now see my uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to uh, be with you today <coughs> to talk about the research I've been doing uh, with my colleagues into digital transformation and how process platforms fit into that. And I'm going to take about 20 minutes of your time today to go through some of that with you. So let's start off by uh, setting everyone's minds at rest in one key respect, and that is that um, it's easy to maybe think that all this talk of digital transformation, digital disruption, is, is just hype. And it's just there to get us to buy more stuff, because let's face it, we're all kind of told to buy more stuff all the time. Um, I'm here to tell you, though, that this really is a, a real thing, and there's no doubt that it finds itself uh, impacting different industries in different ways, but uh, from the research we've done across a whole range of sectors, we're seeing that pretty much every sector we encounter is seeing pressure because of uh, digital technologies and what they do to marketplaces. So on this slide, I wanted to show you a quick example of the financial services space. This is a screenshot of HSBC's website. And what it shows on the left here is how a whole constellation of digital native, if you like, startups are kind of eating away, some people would say unbundling um, HSBC's service portfolio. So some of them focus particularly on uh, current accounts, some on uh, lending, some on investing, some on um, currency transfer, some on mortgages. Um, all, all kinds of different focuses, but they tend to be very focused, they tend to be fast moving, and they are starting to cause the big players who have very bundled offerings. Uh, they start to give these people real cause for concern. But the other important thing to realize is that it's not only nimble digital native startups that are having an impact, digital technologies are also <clears throat> excuse me, impacting the uh, the kind of heritage players, if you like, by creating new opportunities for uh, other kinds of players to come in and compete in different ways. So, for example, we have um, other banks, um, so uh, they're, they're called uh, challenger banks often, for example, in this sector, uh, Handels Bank and Metro Bank, which is starting to make a splash in some UK cities, uh, Shawbrook and Oldermore in the UK as well. Um, really using digital technologies to create new platforms and new services to compete more head-to-head -head with the big players. And we're also seeing out-of-sector competitors that are able to use digital channels to launch um, new kind of uh, resold, kind of white-labeled services, uh, again, principally through digital channels that, again, make it harder for the heritage players to differentiate themselves. So digital technology and digital disruption is not only about the obvious things, like the, the, the small native startups nibbling away uh, and starting to unbundle our offerings. What it's also doing is um, enabling players who may be even out of sector 
like here you can see supermarkets actually coming in and competing from left field. And this, of course, creates an awful lot of tension. What we've seen in the research we've done with, uh, with CXOs over the last year is that when it comes to established companies, though, and, and asking them about what digital actually means, we see quite a lot of confusion. Everyone agrees that it's important, but actually different people have very different ideas about what it actually means. As you can see from this slide, <clears throat> what we typically find is there's four different groups of people, and they each have their own perspective. The important thing to realize is they're actually all correct. They're just only seeing one part of the picture. The important thing to realize, sitting behind this diversity of opinion about what digital technology is and why it's important, is a kind of underlying truth about what digital really does. And from a, an economic perspective, the power of digital, as you can see in the green box here on the left, the power of digital technologies is that it enables an organization to make more efficient, economically speaking, more efficient uh, coordination of resources. What you can see on the right here is a view of uh, a map, if you like, of business resources, and I've I've split that up in a couple of ways. On the left, uh, we can consider digital's impact on resources that an organisation has internally, resources that it controls. On the right, we have a whole load of resources that the organisation doesn't control. They're kind of owned by its customers or they're in the market. At the top of the picture, we're concerned with resources that are about people and what's in their heads. And at the bottom, we're concerned about resources that revolve around processes and physical things. And as you can see, different groups of leaders tend to focus on one particular quadrant of this picture. So communications and HR people will tend to think about, when they think about digital, they'll tend to think about how mobile and social technologies create new opportunities for employee engagement. And that's largely about internal resources that are about people and their knowledge. Whereas marketing people, to take another example, will tend to focus more on the external piece, still around people and their knowledge and their experiences. And they'll be thinking about how social, mobile, um, and uh, how new uh, forms of channel can create uh, platforms for us to engage in new ways with, with the market. And I won't go through all the different examples here, but what we're seeing is that Different groups have different perspectives, and that's really a, f a function of how they see the world and the resources they naturally tend to think about. As a technologist, though, as a technology leader, the important thing to realize is that there's a, a kind of key piece that's not on this picture, and that is the importance of how all of these things actually fit together. Because when you find an organization that is really serious about digital transformation, they very quickly realize that you can't just consider one of these uh, domains in isolation. You actually have to think about how they all fit together. That's really, really important because they all actually support and underpin each other. Uh, and if you miss one out, chances are you'll struggle. So you have to be able to think about how all of these things feed off each other. And the strategic value of technology today, and if you're in a technology leadership or influencing position, this is something you should be seriously thinking about. Is all of these different groups of the executives and their teams have their own ideas and perspectives, these different colored blocks. How can you help them to see the bigger picture, how everything connects together, and then enable them to make sure that work, knowledge, resources, value flow through this picture effectively? Now, something else we found through our research is that um, when we look at who's really going furthest, fastest in this in this sense. It's really shifting quite a lot from how we, how we would have seen things maybe five or ten years ago. Now, I've been in this business quite a long time and I've been researching industry and how it uses technology for nearly 20 years. And certainly ten years ago the picture was hugely different from how it is now. Now um, we see organizations that are saying things like this, this fictitious guy here talking about innovation platforms and fail fast, scale fast, using the language of the lean startup. Many, many of these people are not from where we would have expected 10 years ago. We would have expected 10 years ago that the people driving investment in platforms and innovation would have been banks and um, telcos, typically. People with big IT departments, big capital budgets. Now it's retail, it's utilities, it's travel and transport, it's CPG, it's insurance, it's hospitality.
um, a complete flip. And moreover, when we ask these people, <coughs> excuse me, who do you see as your inspiration? They don't say what well, they might have said 10, 15 years ago, which was would have been IBM, Microsoft, SAP, um, maybe somebody like a Teradata or somebody like that. They talk about uh, Airbnb, they talk about Netflix, they talk about Uber, they talk about AWS, and so on. Very, very different aspirations, very different ways of thinking, and that this, this momentum is really coming from new places. And it's principally because, fundamentally, um, the people who really get this see that this is about internet-based technology. That's really what digital is about. And very quickly, what we've seen over the last two, three, five years is a big shift in the digital technology realm to as-a-service models, where you can get started very cheaply, very quickly, and at relatively low risk. And that means that organizations that need to leapfrog the competition, that don't have big capital budgets, um, but are prepared to experiment, can do that very, very quickly. And they can be very fleet of foot. And that's an important thing to just, just settle on for a moment and think a bit more about. Because one of the other things we find in our research and the, the workshops we run is that a lot of organizations understand the destination of digital, if you know what, if, if you know what I mean. If you, if you think about using the internet, internet-based technologies to get applications and platforms from new places, that kind of software as a service or platform as a service model. Or if you think about uh, what you might call the internet of conversations, how do you use social platforms? Uh, they might think about how to use in instrumented infrastructure, IoT, or they might think about how to use mobile devices, for example. So that's, that's almost like the destination. How can we use cloud, mobile, social, and so on in our business? But the other piece is, to, to reflect back to that previous chart, it's actually about how digital technologies change the way that change can work in your organization. And that's a much more nuanced point that it's really important to remember. It's not just about the destination, it's about how you get there. And successful use of digital technologies enables you to get there in a fundamentally different way to how you would have done before. And that's because digital platforms do two key things, or good digital platforms do two key things together, and that's the right-hand side of this picture. They provide an underpinning that is instrumented. So by building products and services and business processes on these platforms, you get to see what's happening. You get to see what's working, what doesn't work, what's liked, what's not liked, what's used and what's not used. Then you use that instrumentation, that insight, to drive change, drive agility. Good digital platforms do both of those things and create this, uh, and enable this virtuous cycle of insight and agility. And that's really what distinguishes the people who are really flying now with digital transformation from those who are really struggling still. Whether they realize that it's also about how you use platforms to get instrumentation, insight, and agility. Now, the challenge that a lot of uh, the more mature organizations, the, the, the kind of the organizations that have been around for 20, 50 uh, years or longer, the big challenge that many of these organizations face when they look at this is they know that um, success is going to be measured, and, and we know that this is how most organizations look at measuring this. They want to measure success in terms of how the customer's experience is impacted. Does all this change using digital technology enable us to give the customer a better experience and, and ultimately, of course, increase customer lifetime value, increase NPS, all those kind of good things. And what we also know is that when people talk about this, they, they're really talking about uh, integrating experiences. So a good experience is one that is consistent across channels and venues and platforms. It's one where, if you like, the right hand and the left hand know what each other's doing. So if you talk to somebody in a store and then you go online and maybe you call someone in a call center, you get the sense that everybody is singing from the same hymn sheet, as, they, as you might say, that there is a consistent base of knowledge and experience and, and a set of policies that drive all of those interactions across all of those channels and platforms and venues. Now, fundamentally, if that is then about integration, the challenge that heritage organizations have got, who've been around for a long time, 
is that typically the large ones, most particularly, um, have spent 10, 15 years going in the opposite direction. Not integrating, but actually dispersing, particularly in operations, um, creating shared services centers, taking business processes off, offshore, creating uh, bigger partner networks, and then orchestrating uh, resources and, and, uh, and work across that, that partner network. So actually globally dispersing um, the operational side of the business. And this creates a huge challenge, doesn't it? Because if what we're trying to do is use digital technologies to create new experiences, that's kind of the, the head of the arrow, if you like. How do we do that if our operations have been dispersed? This is where digital platforms come in again, because success really we, it relies on weaving a digital thread that runs from the front edge to the back edge of your organization. And you might think of it, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not the best... Uh, artist, but you might think of it in this way. Uh, if you think about a customer's journey as they interact with your brand and use your products and services, they may not realize it, but that you are taking them on a journey that follows this kind of brown line from the front edge to the back edge of your organization. And you need to be able to support that with a platform that enables you to share knowledge and coordinate work at scale. As the customer goes on this journey, you need to enable that to be followed with a digital thread. Um, and that's a key, key part of what a good digital platform should do for you, is enable you to share knowledge and coordinate work so that you can support the customer's journey, even in a dispersed operational context. And good process platforms are really all about this, it turns out. If you think back to the pieces I was just talking through, there are three key elements that we're really looking for, and they all map onto the things that good process platforms will provide. They share knowledge, enable you to share knowledge and coordinate work across teams, departments, and even business entities. They make it easy to change behavior and policy and so on because they provide the right kind of tools so that different groups of people can work together in a very visual way, understand the impact of change. So that's the agility piece. And they also give you the instrumentation piece, that's number three here. They enable you to track and manage performance over time, so you can see what's working and what's not working, and you can drive change as a result. Good process platforms do all these three things, and all these three things are things that we really need if we're serious about making significant gains with digital technologies. Now, there's one more piece I want to share with you before I hand off uh, back to Vasilios, who's going to introduce the other guys here on this webinar. And that's what I call uh, the corporate knowledge conundrum. Because it, there's another layer of challenge, actually, that many organizations face, <clears throat> and particularly organizations uh, with, um, with uh, significant kind of investments in, in, in physical operations. So not digital companies, digital natives, but organizations that have been around for a long time, serving customers in kind of physical locations. And on the left-hand side, what we can see here is um, a chart of how the S&P 500, so this is the aggregate of the 500 largest public organizations in the US, how do those people in aggregate, or how have they over time, reported their value for the street? In 1975, you can see that over four-fifths of how they valued themselves was based on the value of tangible assets, and that's... That's goods, materials, buildings, vehicles, tools, machinery, all of those things. And less than a fifth was intangible asset value, so knowledge fundamentally, or value gained from knowledge-related activities. And you can see that over the following 40 years, that has flipped pretty much exactly to where over 80% of the value that those people report is actually based on the value of assets which are fundamentally knowledge driven. Meanwhile, in many of the industries that we see most of the desire for transformation, where there's lots of physical operation, lots of physical venues, um, we do have very, very high turnover um, workforces in some elements. And the key thing to realize is that um, that turnover is not distributed evenly. Typically speaking, when you think about an organization which has a lot of physical uh, 
stores or venues um, or you know other other kind of places where people need to get work done in front of the customer those places where we have the highest turnover and the places where we typically unfortunately pay people the least and where they may not get as much training as other people where they may uh, struggle to progress as well there may be barriers to them doing so those jobs tend to be in the customer facing roles and remember that we're serious here about driving great customer experience and today whether we like it or not even with digital transformation customer experience is not going to be delivered completely digitally we're going to need people in the mix in the call center in the store uh, on the railway pl platform uh, you know in the field fixing problems for the customer we need to find ways to bring them into the picture and if we have high turnover workforce if we have problems with getting people up to speed, training them fast enough, we're going to struggle. It doesn't really fit our agenda. And this is another key point of how digital platforms can play a role because if we're serious about this, we need platforms that enable us to, again, share knowledge and coordinate work so that people always have the tools at hand to be able to do their best for the customer, even if they've not had the luxury of the training that they might have ideally wanted. The right platform gives us the tools to enable everybody to be as good as the best, to enable the freshest uh, graduate or the freshest uh, entry level person in the role to be as effective as one of the more experienced people. It's a way of driving knowledge uh, through, um, through a population. The last thing I'll leave you with is important consideration. When you're looking to maybe make an investment in a platform, that's going to help you with business processes, coordination of work, sharing of knowledge. You may not have all of this on your agenda right now, but you probably will have it on your agenda fairly soon. Whether the particular hot buttons in your organization are likely to be around big data analytics, maybe around bots and AI, maybe around cloud, maybe mobile, social. Probably not all of those, certainly probably not all at once. But when you think about the potential impacts of these things on the questions we ask ourselves as we design work, you realize that there's fundamental transformation coming. When you think about designing work, you think about what work needs to be done. Who's going to do the work? What order does the work need to be done in? Where do people need to be when they do the work? And so on. And then think about the impact of these technologies. They enable fundamental rethinking and re-engineering of work. And as I said, this may not all be on your agenda today, but it's going to come sometime. So when you're thinking about making an investment in a platform, make sure that you think about a platform that gives you choices. Think about a platform that gives you openness so you can configure the platform in certain ways. Yes, deliver from the cloud. Yes, deliver on premise. Yes, deliver uh, with uh, different kinds of front ends, so we don't necessarily rely on one particular UI. Don't lock yourselves into one kind of experience. There are platforms that give you the ability to be agile, using models extensively to enable different groups of people to come together and collaborate. Um, that's the key point I want to leave you with, really. Good process platforms will enable you to drive digital transformation because of everything I've explained. And as you start to look at investing, make sure you choose a platform that gives you choices, collaboration ability, uh, the ability to, to measure clearly, and agility, basically what you see on this picture. I'm going to hand you back to Vasilios now, and uh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, that was an excellent presentation, uh, if you don't mind me saying so. Very interesting research findings, and thank you very much for that. So. Uh, in less than 60 seconds, uh, first of all, thank you all for your questions. Please keep them coming. We have a dedicated Q&A session towards the end, and uh, there are quite a few for you, Neil, already, so we'll try to tackle them uh, later. There will be a, a follow-up blog post for any questions we may not have time to share. The, the decks will be shared on SlideShare. Uh, the recording will be shared with all of you afterwards. So uh, if you miss something and we don't have the time to cover it, just rest assured we will you know, come back to you. BNM Soft uh, is uh, an intelligent BPM platform. Uh, we are on the Gardner Magic Quadrant. We have just moved to Visionaries from Niche. And we're also on the Forrester low-code and digital business landscape. 
Arman tries to believe in friendly software that is agile, easy to use, and easy to change. And lastly, we are a Gempact company, uh, a Gempact being a global leader in BPM solution and services. So to set the scene uh, about Southwest Water, Southwest Water is a water provider and provides reliable, efficient, and high-quality drinking water and wastewater services throughout Cornwall and Devon and in small areas of Dorset and Somerset. They have been working with us since 2013 and they use our process platform to help allocate work optimally to service agents via Microsoft Dynamics CRM. As part of the Open Water Initiative, Southwest Water has embarked on a mission-critical project to create a retailer portal that enables retailers to request operational work and ensure this work is performed optimally in integration with Microsoft Dynamics CRM. So let's hear now from Alistair Button, Program Manager at Southwest Water, who will explain what is Open Water, how Southwest Water is utilizing PNM Soft's process platform, and we'll also hear from Michelle Pope and John Hill, who they got in touch with us uh, earlier in the week and we interviewed them. So this is a, a video I'm going to be sharing with you. So if you just bear with me one second. Uh, Alistair, can you please tell me a little bit about yourself? Uh, okay, so I am a program manager working for Southwest Water. I've been here for 23 years. Um, so it starts off in the service desk role, move through um, the um, what we call the infrastructure team, so sort of PC and server support, and then into project management um, about 13 years ago, and then through there into program management, where I've been for about the last five or so years. Currently, um, and currently I'm program managing the uh, the Open Water program for uh, for IS. So, uh, can you please uh, explain uh, what open water is? Okay, so open water is all about um, competition in the in the water market, uh, specifically um, competition for business customers. Uh, in the first instance, so in April 2017, uh, all our business customers will, and in fact, business customers nationwide, will be able to choose who they get their water supply from. Uh, so in essence, from our point of view, what we're trying to do is, is split apart our business. So we're splitting, splitting it into the wholesale and retail sections. And um, what we're trying to do to, to ensure that uh, we have proven separation between those two elements uh, to the point where we can't be, um, we can't be accused of showing our incumbent retailer any favoritism, we're looking to set up our own separate retail, non-household retail company. So from an IS perspective, uh, what Open Water is about is getting our wholesale side of the business prepared, uh, upgrading systems, adding a few new systems uh, in order to enable us to, to work in the new marketplace, and establishing a brand new non-household retail company. Thank you very much for that. So can you please describe how Sequence will help Southwest Water uh, for their open water initiative? Yes, certainly. So one of the one of the elements of the uh, open water solution that we're looking to build is a portal, a, a retailer portal that has to be built by the wholesaler to enable retailers to request operational work. So for example, if they want a new meter or they want a meter accuracy check or a disconnection, these sorts of requests uh, would tend to come from the retailer direct to the wholesaler and bypass the central market operator. And we saw Sequence as being able to offer a good solution in that space for a number of different reasons. So from a Southwest Water point of view, number one, first and foremost, we had a relationship already with PNM Soft, a good working relationship with PNM Soft, and we knew the product. Uh, and we knew what the product was capable of, so it, it sort of saved us a lot of time in terms of um, finding something new and, and learning that and, and implementing that. So we felt that Sequence would, would allow us to sort of fast track a, a solution, if you like. Uh, number two, um, we felt that um, essentially what we'd be looking for is a, a set of web forms uh, for the customer to interact with that looked professional and had a degree of a good degree of validation 
uh, built within it so that we could in essentially ensure that the requests that we were getting uh, were were accurate and didn't require a lot of manual uh, error correction uh, on our side. Uh, number three, we felt that um, by bringing those requests from a web form into sequence meant that we could uh, enforce that they all go through the same standard uh, business process um, rather than, uh, you know, again, we could, we could potentially have been accused of showing uh, different retailers and uh, a different level of service, but by all retailers coming in through the same uh, through the same method and being pushed through this exactly the same business process uh, in exactly the same way, time and time again, we could ensure that we are showing both fairness and, and a consistency in approach. Also, pushing pushing it through that um, an automated business process is allowing us to uh, monitor and measure um, our performance against each of those each of those stages within each business process. So within, within the open water um, governance dictated by uh, the open water program, there are a number of SLAs that wholesalers are expected to uphold. And pushing all of our, our operational processes through sequence will allow us to monitor and track those processes, report against them, uh, both sort of historically and via real-time dashboards to, um, so that we can see very quickly where we're likely to miss any SLAs and potentially start to incur performance penalties. I think the other reason um, that we went with sequence, probably finally, is, is that there are 42 of these processes that we need to build, and they are driven from 26 uh, electronic web forms. So that's quite a lot of work in order to, to build all of that. And we saw sequence as being a good tool in that primarily it's a, it's a drag and drop type uh, building environment that didn't necessitate a lot of um, coding from a from a, either a developer on our side or or one on PNM soft side. So from our point of view, it felt like a solution that we could we could build fairly simply in house with a bit of support from PNM soft um, and. Um, like I say, get get a solution up and running as, as quickly as possible. Brilliant. So, what are your future sequence plans at Southwest Water, Alistair? Okay, so the the first phase of our sequence implementation is due to conclude in September. Mainly, um, a set of web forms that will, that will kick off um, forty two business processes, and there'll be a degree of reporting attached to it. Going forward, um, what we the next phase of the project, we'll be looking to enhance some of those business processes. So we'll be making them a little bit more detailed, more, uh, more, um, more functionally rich, I guess. We'll be looking also to investigate integration with back-end systems. Um, in the first instance, our Microsoft Dynamics CRM system, but then also our ERP system, which is um, a system called Ellipse, and possibly one or two others. So we'll be looking to take advantage of the, the integration capabilities of sequence. We'll be looking to further build on the reporting side. So once we've got real data flowing through the system, we will start to get an understanding from our business colleagues in terms of exactly what it is that they're looking to, to, to monitor and capture. Uh, so we'll be able to start to build more in terms of, terms of that. And um, I think we'd also be looking to uh, build our um, resources in-house. So at the moment, in order to meet the timescales, we're using um, quite a bit, I'd say, of PNM soft uh, development experience. We'll be looking to um, enhance that by uh, doing more of the build ourselves internally, both in terms of the, the process builds, the web form builds, and the reporting. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. My name is Michelle Pope. I'm actually the service delivery manager in the back office team. So when we refer to back office, it's dealing with written correspondence excluding complaints. So we deal with all correspondence from customers in relation to customer moves, installments, etc. I also head up um, or work with our team in India. Uh, so I help build that relationship with them. And I've recently just um, overseeing the Bournemouth account. So being kept quite busy.
So I've been back with South West Water for two years, took a bit of a break, but prior to that I was here for 10. Thank you very much. And can you please describe how Sequence works at your department? So um, we use Sequence to allocate our work. So obviously we have a team of individuals and what it does is it allocates the work based on availability and the number of hours that they work in each day. So it will pick up, okay, I've got, for example, I've got Emma who works seven hours a day. She's available, so I'm going to send her X amount of items into her queue. So it's very queue driven. And how does it affect your day-to-day -day working life? It helps us prioritize, so obviously it would be a manual exercise if we didn't have sequence, sequence allocating that work. We would have to manually sit there and calculate who to give the work to and then constantly move that work around depending on availability. Thank you very much. Can you please um, introduce yourself? Sure. So uh, my name is John Hill. I'm the uh, Customer Billing and Systems Manager. Um, for Southwest Water and Bournemouth Water in the household retail side of the business. Um, so I look after um, all of our corporate systems and administration here. Thank you very much. And can you please describe how Sequence works at Southwest Water? Um, so we use um, Sequence to integrate with our CRM system for um, work management. Uh, so essentially it um, picks up the work that we have to be done for the day um, and automatically allocates it where it can to um, our staff. Brilliant. And can you please describe how it works with uh, your other technologies uh, such as the CRM that you mentioned? Um, so the, the prime integration that we have is, is with CRM. Um, so we use Microsoft Dynamics CRM. Um, when we introduced our CRM system, we, we had a challenge um, in so much of the, the work queue management. So while CRM gave us some very powerful tools to manage customer contacts uh, and cases and, and drive through the customer relationship, um, it left us with a, a slight gap um, with regards to work allocation and queue management. Um, so we decided to um, look at the sequence product um, which we integrated into Dynamics. Um, we receive um, something in the region of um, a thousand work items each day that have to be reviewed and, and worked by a member of staff, um, and that's spread across several hundred different work types. So with the integration between Dynamics and Sequence, um, we were able to automatically allocate that work um, across the staff um, so the integration really was to um, leave our, our supervisors and our team managers um, to manage in the team and do what they do best and leave the, the pushing around of work um, to a sequence for us. Excellent. Thank you very, very much for that. Yeah. So did you come across any obstacles and what were the lessons learned? Uh, so no obstacles as such. It was a, it was a relatively straightforward implementation. Um, I guess it helped because we had a, an awful lot of upfront planning in terms of the, the landscape of our CRM system. So what helped us and, and what I'd probably recommend for others looking to deploy the solution um, is to make sure all of the individual work queues and work types, um, all of the staff details, um, their working patterns and availability um, are all clearly mapped out and understood, uh, understood sorry, rather to the um, deployment of the system. Um, because we had all that mapped out and understood by the, the teams um, looking to implement the solution, it was um, much more straightforward and um, saved any um, mismatches of queues to allocation when we went live. Excellent. Thank you very, very much for that. Okay, so let's take a look at Sequence in Action using Southwest Water and Open Water as an example. We'll be looking at three people involved in the process here. We have James, who works for a water retailer, and we have Tom and Jane, who both work in the wholesale division of Southwest Water. So we're going to start with James, and James has access to the wholesale self-service portal. Here he can view his requests that he has outstanding. 
and he can also create new requests. So we're going to create a new request and from here he then has access to the 42 different processes that are part of open water split into nine parts and we're interested in part B metering and within part B what we have here is PNM soft are looking to have a new meter installed and so James raises process B7 and this then gives him access to the form that he can fill in in order to submit the request this is a standard form issued by Open Water that we have um, created within sequence. So it starts off with some instructions on what James needs to do and then a simple wizard-like user experience to step through the various sections. There's five sections within here starting with collecting the details about the retailer because James from Thames Water and he is logged onto the portal we can look up in Dynamics CRM and pull back all of his details so he doesn't need to enter those details. The only item he needs to fill in is a reference. And of course there's full validation on these forms so before we move on we can make sure all of the data is complete. Section 2 is capturing details about the actual premises where the meter needs to be installed and we can quickly just fill in some details there and it's for PM Soft who are in Watford. Within our forms we can have some dynamic behavior such as if the address is different than we're interested in we can have an area pop up for that. Fill out all the mandatory fields and move on. At any point James can save the form there's a lot of information here, so something may happen that he means he needs to stop working on this and come back to it later, and he has that option. But he's going to carry on. Now section 3 is where it starts getting interesting. This form can be used for just about any task relating to a meter, installing a new meter, checking a meter is still accurate, replacing a faulty meter, changing the meter to perhaps a newer smart meter. And James can select one or more options from here, could select all four. In this case, we are just interested in a meter installation. Now what happens, there's some subsections. There's actually five subsections, 3.1 through to 3.5. But some of them are only relevant in certain areas. Meter installation only requires section 3.2 meter installation to be completed. We can have drop downs on here that can pull details out from other systems as well, from dynamic CRM, from ERP systems, and many others. So, here we've actually jumped over section 3.1, 3.3, 4, and 5 because they're not relevant to a meter installation. If we'd have ticked some of the other areas, they would have been presented to the user. So, very simple, straightforward experience leading the user through only what they need to complete. Can Southwest Water contact the end customer directly? We're going to say yes. And we can give some details of the customer so that Southwest Water can, can uh, can contact the customer directly. Now if we'd have said no there, the process would have taken a slightly different route and I'll cover that a little later. We can then sign the form, give the roles and submit. So once this has been completed, we'll then have an additional item up here. And at any point James can come back in here, he can see how it's progressing by using the view status which gives a graphical representation of the process, the steps, the high level steps of the process. We've submitted the request, we can now see that request is being reviewed. And we'll come back and see this later as it moves through the process. Excellent visibility 
We don't need to phone the help desk up to say how is our request come along. We can use self-service to see that. So reduce calls to the wholesale desk. So we're now going to move over into the wholesale service desk, who Tom is part of. And Tom has a similar portal, but this has a lot more content for him. Within here, he can see all of the tasks that he's receiving in an inbox. He can view requests, any documents relating to it, dashboards, we'll see later, and so on. But he's interested in his tasks to do. And he has a new task has appeared down here. He can see when that task is due. And it's due one working day from the date it was received. If this was received on Friday the 1st, obviously the due date would be Monday the 3rd, or 4th even. And a traffic light indicator shows when this particular task is either on time, about to be due, or overdue. And Tom can open the task from here, and he can see all the details about the task. What needs to happen now is he needs to review this form, check it's all complete, check it's all viable. And he can either review it now and decide to action it, or he can just go ahead and say, yes, I'm going to fetch this task. It's currently sitting on the queue for anyone to action. He's happy to action this. He clicks fetch. It disappears from his colleague's list of tasks. He can now action it. He can go through and he can review the details. But what he's also got up here as part of the summary are links into CRM. They can take him straight into the retailer's account, the contact's account record, or the case that we have created as part of the process. So here we can see a new case has been created in CRM. All the details have been populated, who it's for, who it relates to. We've included some descriptions down here. We've got some custom fields down here. These can all be updated by sequence. That allows us to be able to see in dynamic CRM exactly where we are with this case. So Tom can go through, he can review all of the details. And then down at the bottom, he's got results. Is the request viable? Yes, we're happy with that. And yes, we do need a site visit just to check a couple of items out. And he clicks Submit. <coughs> now, it's at this point that we took two slight different routes. If, it, if we hadn't have been allowed to contact the customer directly, then a task would have gone back to the retailer for the retailer to do that uh, contact to arrange the site visit and we'd have been informed of when that is. But because we can contact the site visit, Tom can phone the customer up, he could have all the details available here and he can tell the sequence when that's going to be. And it's going to be, let's say it's going to be later today at about 12 o'clock. So we've got someone in the area, they can go along and they can do that. Now everything is on hold because we are now waiting for that site visit to happen. So let's have a look at how we can see that. We'll come out of Tom's theme. And we'll come and have a look at Dynamic CRM in closer detail. Here we can see some of the dashboards that show us in CRM exactly how many cases we've got, how they're progressing, what types they are, lots of good information in here. We'll also see later some examples of um, some dashboards that aren't in CRM. And if I go to my service area and we have a look at our cases, i see all of our cases. Let's have a look at the new ones. So we've got lots of B7 requests in here. Here's the one that has been created. No, it's not that one that's created today. Let's find it. There we go. And we can open it. It's the case that Tom was looking at. All the details in here. We've now updated this with that site visit date. And we can see down here it's pending. And we've moved on to step two of the process. So everything is on hold now until this site visit has taken place. 
and I could action that within sequence. But the field team, they work within CRM. So the field engineer, once they've done the site visit, they can come in here, they can click on here, and they can select completed. And now behind the scenes, sequence and CRM are communicating with each other. CRM tells sequence that case has been completed, and the process can then move on. And to see that that has happened, we come back in as Tom, he'll see notification of site visit. This is telling Tom and in fact the whole team that the site visit has in fact taken place and it took place at 10.57. And if we were to go back into CRM we would see that everything has moved on accordingly. And he can confirm that, say he's happy with that, and so the process will move on. At any point, James can come back in and he can see his particular uh, process in action. But we're now going to have a little look at Jane and see what Jane can see. Because Jane heads up the service team. So she's interested in not only what is happening on a case-by-case -case basis, but she's interested in across all cases. So she has some dashboards available that show her how many cases are open, how are they split by type, what type are they, so how are they split by the step that they are in the process, and how are they split by type of request. Here's a report showing everything that's in flight and we can see traffic light indicators telling me which ones are perhaps overdue. We've got filters on here so if I can want to just see specific customer, specific retailer, specific work type I can filter all of the information accordingly. She can see close requests and so more historical information. And also, <clears throat> across the retailers, her customers, how we're performing. Part of Open Water is about making sure that all retailers are treated fairly and equally. So this information shows, yes, how many requests are we receiving? How long are we taking to action um, the requests for each customer? What are our charges that we're receiving and so on? So just to give an overall picture of how the team is performing across all of the retailers. <clears throat> so we've seen how we can launch a request from the portal and see it flowing through touching CRM as part of the process. But we may also have one of the team may be in CRM rather than the retailer filling out the self-service portal, they may phone the team up and ask for the request to be submitted on their behalf. So I'm now back in CRM and let's say that James from Thames Water phones up and asks for a request. So we can come in, we can find Thames Water and within here we've got an additional capability where we can select some processes and just as we had within the portal we've now got access to those nine sections and within there we've got access to process B7 which this brings up exactly the same form that we can now fill in on behalf of James. Working within CRM one user experience I don't need to go out to another portal to fill this out. And from here, the process carries on in exactly the same way. So you don't have to maintain two separate processes, two separate applications. Everything is started from where it needs to start, from the channel it needs to be started in. But then the process will be exactly the same. So once this is filled in, the service team will receive the task just as if it had been filled in on the self-service portal. And then finally, let's have a little look at how all this happens behind the scenes. Sequence has its App Studio, a graphical environment that allows us to be able to 
configure the processes in a business friendly notation. So here this is the same view as we saw in the workflow status earlier on. Simple steps in the process, easy to follow, easy to see where each case is. But of course there's lots going on behind the scenes. This is Sequence's dual view. Be able to have two views, a business view, the high level, simple steps. And then we have the technical view that allows us to put all that clever stuff that was going on. Stepping the user through the various forms based on business rules to decide which parts of the forms we show next. Creating items automatically in CRM and updating those so that everything happens in CRM. The user doesn't need to go in and manually create items in CRM. Integrating with other systems, pulling information from other systems, updating other systems. Having SLAs within here to make sure that cases happen on time. Lots of other capabilities can be put in here to automate the process. While at the high level, the business have the nice simple view that they need in order to be able to action and understand where the process is. Here, for instance, here's the logic deciding, well, can we contact the customer directly? If we can, we arrange the site visit. If not, we ask the retailer to arrange the site visit, but we still then come back to the same point down here, at which point we wait for the site visit to happen. And once CRM has told Sequence, yes, that's happened, then we can move on to that step that we saw, Tom, notification of the site visit and so on. Using our hot change capabilities, it's then very easy to make changes to the process to create new versions to be able to have any in-flight cases carrying on on the previous version and any new cases carrying on, uh, sorry, starting with the new version. Or we may want to make a change if they're long-running processes, we can make a change to in-flight processes as well. All part of Sequence's hot change architecture. So hopefully that's given you a feel for Sequence in action and how it can be used within such scenarios as Southwest Water and uh, Open Water. Thank you very much to the Southwest Water team who took time out of the busy schedules and talked to us about their experience of PNM soft sequence uh, to address regulation changes and to extend their Microsoft Dynamics CRM with smart work allocation capabilities. Uh, thank you all for the questions. Uh, Sadly, we, we reached the full hour, but uh, if, Neil, if you have time, we can do a couple of questions, if that's okay with you. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of minutes, yeah. Okay, so uh, you mentioned that the tech leaders you spoke to aspire to be like Netflix, etc. Uh, what is it about them that they want to copy? Uh, principally, the, the thing that uh, people cite as the reasons why they want to uh, emulate these people is it's really about the agility. Um, it's about their ability to launch uh, new product features, services uh, quickly and to uh, fundamentally their skill in using data to gather insight about what works and what doesn't work. So it comes back to that chart I showed a little bit later in the presentation where I talked about how the right platform gives you insight through instrumentation and agility and, and it was that combination that people um, who were further ahead in this really seem to uh, find most interesting in, in companies like Netflix is their ability to do those two things together. Thank you very much for that. Uh, one final question. Uh, do you have research on innovation programs and platforms specifically? Uh, yeah, well, so we're, we're um, at the moment, um, a colleague of mine is, is actually uh, exploring the um, innovation platform space and we also are running on our website um, an innovation benchmarking tool so if you currently have an innovation program in your business um, or an initiative um, you can actually come to our website and uh, run uh, a self-assessment where you actually find out how your initiative compares uh, and you can get a, a personalized action plan as well um, and so if you visit uh, if you visit our site and uh, you can just take that for free. It's uh, super quick and easy, and it's uh, it's it's pretty interesting. We've we got some good feedback from it. 
Super, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, there are several other questions, but as promised earlier, we will uh, prepare a follow-up blog post to this webinar with the recording, with the slides, and with any uh, un unanswered questions. So thank you all very much for coming, and we look forward to welcoming you in our next webinar. Goodbye.